the demo just worked. I just saw it, so you're gonna you're gonna like this. I hope I haven't jinxed it by saying that. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> good. Yes. So uh, our last speaker of the day. We we wanted. We know you're tired, and uh, I appreciate that everybody's uh, still you know coming back and uh, seating yourselves and respecting the the speakers here today. It's a fantastic atmosphere. So really appreciated by uh, everybody. I'm sure up here, but uh, we wanted something fun for the last talk, and when we were going through the, the selection committee, was going through the CFP submissions, I, I lolled uh, at this guy's because uh, one of the lines in the description of his talk was uh, hitting it with a hammer. So, I mean, uh, what else could we do? We, we had to have something uh, a little exciting for the end here. So uh, our second speaker of the day and our second Dave from the Commonwealth, uh, IoT shenanigans, take it away. Dave. Can you hear me? Oh, that's loud. Right. Hello. Um, oh, I'm Dave. Um, I, you may have seen me on Twitter occasionally. I do this sort of thing. I mainly hack stuff. If you see my Twitter, you'll see my avatar a lot. Uh, that's a burning Furby. It was a barbecue. We were drunk. What, what else are you going to do? I normally mess around. Well, I've, I've been in InfoSec for 20 years, and I do a lot of stuff. But nowadays, recently, I've been messing around with a lot of hardware and IoT because it's interesting. So, you know, I don't always stick my hand up an IoT's device, but that was me when I had more hair. So one thing I'm going to start with is... Um, talking about vectors and attack, especially in the physical world. So just as an example, I was walking up to my kid's school one day and they'd redone everything and they put up these brand fancy new fences to replace the hedges that they previously had. Can anybody see the floor in that? Anybody from the floor? Let me just zoom in a bit. They've put the bolts on the wrong side. A few seconds with a uh, a drill on, on, a screw, on the right screw bit, I'll be in there. Found this on a walk. <laughs> in fairness, I don't, I think it was just cheaper to use a padlock instead of a chain bit, but so on. So it's one of the things that we see in IoT that people don't get is what is an attack surface? What are the vectors of attack? As a sort of thought process, a thought experiment, when I moved into my first house 20 years ago, um, I discovered that the previous owners had locked the shed and then never left the locks behind. So that isn't the shed, that's my current shed. Um, just as a sort of thought process, how would you get in there? Any ideas? Break the window, that's a good one. Anything else? Hinges, Hinges? yep, brilliant idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> No, it isn't. The, the, the rather excellent roofing you can see is um, a result of me and a couple of mates replacing the roof and having a few beers. So that's why it's a bit shoddy. Um, so we can go for the lock. We can use lock picks. We can use a hacksaw, which is what I did in the end. It takes 20 minutes to, to saw through a shackle. We can use the hinges. We could throw a brick through the window or we can get a bunch of mates to lift off the roof, because most sheds, the roof isn't actually attached. It's just held on there by gravity. But I'm going to delve in a bit. This has just been to demonstrate vectors. Um, specifically, I'm going to go into smart locks, which we're seeing more and more nowadays. Um, here is one that was reported a couple of weeks ago, where people started, we're seeing on Airbnb, we're seeing in tenant houses that, that landlords are going, we must have smart locks because it allows us to get in and it allows us to control, so we just give access to the app. No keys. Sounds great. And personally, I'm for smart locks. I don't know about some of you, but I'm reaching the age where I occasionally walk out my front door and go, did I lock that door? In fact, I did that when, on my way here to, um, yesterday when I went to the airport and I got about five miles and then I went, shit. Um, and had to turn around. Oh, sorry, I just got... <laughs> Thanks. You're just making me feel young. Uh, and just as a traditional, I had to do with a Google thing. As we can see on there, you type in Bluetooth locks and we see 
hacked and hackable. Now, that, to be fair, there was a presentation in DEF CON in 2016 on some of the first generation of Bluetooth locks. Um, and a lot of them are rubbish. What we're sort of seeing nowadays is Chineseium locks. If you search on Amazon, eBay, any, anywhere that you go in, you'll see a lot of these Bluetooth locks for, well, in my terms, 20 pounds or whatever that is in NOC, I'm not certain. Um, but they're relatively cheap. You can buy them for pretty much what you'd expect to buy a bit about double the price of an all padlock. They sound great, don't they? Uh, whilst I'm at it, I was uh, looking through to gather more ones, and I went to Amazon, and I found this brilliant Photoshop. <laughs> I'm not certain what exactly that lock's meant to attach to, but... Uh, and by the way, that lock looks really big and strong, doesn't it? Here it is. <laughs> I was quite disappointed when that arrived. So, going back to my initial point about attack vectors and uh, attack surface, sorry, vectors and attack surface, with a traditional lock, we have a number of attack vectors. We have the shackle, the latch, the body, and the lock. All of these have different weaknesses that can be got. If we go into the world, wonderful world of smart locks, we add a load of new ones. We have a motor. Something has to you know, open that lock. It can be a solenoid. Solenoids have their own different attacks, but I'm not going to go into those because they're quite rare. Uh, we have an unlocking sensor. Normally, it's Bluetooth low energy, um, and, but there are fingerprint locks. I've got one here which is exclusively fingerprint. Oops. Try not to knock everything everywhere. That's exclusively fingerprint lock. Yeah, I wouldn't use that one. I could probably bite through that shackle. Um, and there's a charging point, because a lot of them, if they have batteries, they want to charge through USB, because everybody's got blue, uh, USB. They don't always disable the USB on it. So you can occasionally just actually get data through there. But also, we have the mobile app, how it talks to the internet, and an API. These are all possible attack vectors that we can use. So, let's look at body attacks. Um, I stole this from Wikipedia uh, because I'm lazy. And there's some important things. Most modern locks are built using an alloy called Zamek 3. It's relatively, it's non-magnetic, um, and it's relatively hard-wearing. And the best thing about it is it's very cheap to cast. So you can just put the internal workings of the lock and build them however you want inside it. A couple of problems with Zamek 3. First one is the melting temperature, which is um, nearly 400 degrees Celsius. One problem with that, a plumber's blowtorch goes to about 1,000. So if I use a blowtorch, about two minutes it takes, and it, and it all nicely melts off, and I can just get into it. The second one is hardness, uh, which is measured in something called brinnel. Um, go to Wikipedia if you want more details about that. But at 97, you can just use a Dremel. Here's one I did earlier. Um, as you can see, that's one I Dremeled, and I managed to extract the motherboard out of it. <clears throat> Other ones, um, a YouTuber called Jerry Rig Everything uh, had a look at something called a tap lock, and they found a problem with this locking pin here where occasionally it wouldn't engage, so you could literally just rotate the back and it would pop open. <laughs> Gets worse. It's a back door. So, sorry? That's a back door. It's a back door, yes, very good. Um, it gets worse. This is one of the Chinese ones. I don't have it with me because I had to leave a few of them at home. I do apologize as well. It was some when I took this. Those are my, short, those, my, those are my, my legs in shorts. Try not to see them. You will be seeing them now. Um, you can see that little rubber bung that you've got. Let's just remove that rubber bung. What's that? It, and out here, and now we have access to, well, it's not much, but there's a, just a zoomed up version here. And you can see a battery cell, which is just a 3.7 line cell. And these are just two wires which go to the motor. Once I've got access to those, I can spike the motor directly. I can send current to it. Um, another one we've got 
I'm going to need two hands for this, is I've done this so many times I can do this with my fingers. This is something called a mica lock, originally reviewed by ah, um, somebody called Lock Picking Lawyer, who's on a YouTube and Twitter, and you can see, I can just pop the front open. <laughs> originally, I had to use a screwdriver to do that, but now I can just do it with fingernails. Here's a zoomed in version. Uh, what we can see is we can see debugging pads. So potentially there's something I can tack soldering wires to. Or just for even simpler, I can go directly to the motor contacts. And I can just spike current through them. I will be demoing that later if it works. Um, a little word of a, a warning is the demo gods hate me. Okay? Things generally don't work. Even though I've just tried them again, they will not work. And I've been cursed today. Thank you. One of one, just a final one on the body, is uh, something called the Urvatron. I, I probably mispronounced that. Um, which was found out there, which had a little interesting little flaw. Let me just zoom in. What can you see there? It's another screw. What the best bit about this was this was uh, disclosed to the con to the customer. Sorry, not the customer, to the company. And they sent an email back with a quality statement in it. I'm going to read this one out. Literally, we designed this fingerprint lock for the purpose of against in theft. However, the lock is invincible to the people who do not have a screwdriver. <laughs> On to the shackle, or the loopy bit, as I like to call it. So, attack vectors against this, a hacksaw. Takes ages, but you can do it. You've got shims, so you, these are thin bits of aluminium. Al Aluminium, aluminium that you can wrap around the shackle and, and disengage the latch. And you can use bolt cutters. So I'm going to demo this in a second. So I've locked up my bag here just because I'm stupid. Here's the keys. Anybody want some keys? Right. I don't know whether anybody's actually ever tried this. Ha, ha, has anybody ever seen a technique for opening a zip directly? So, one of the things about zips is you can actually force something between the teeth. I'm going to have to put the microphone down for this. Um, sorry. You can force something between the teeth. And this will, this will never work now. Now I've got an audience. <laughs> Ah, and what you can do is then actually force the zip open. Both times I did this in test, it actually worked perfectly. There we are. So you can actually open the bag directly. And the best bit about this, as you can see, it's open, is you can just, the zip is self-repairing. Oh, it is when I can do it properly. Um, ah. and you can just force it together. Unfortunately, it's not going to work now. Da, ah, it's mostly done. So, <laughs> that's one of the things. But personally, I like to, to, treat, to cheat. I am actually surprised they let, these let me carry these through customs. <laughs> can I borrow you again for the uh, yes. microphone? Thanks. So, I love bolt cutters, they're great as takes a few seconds, locks easy to remove. And apparently you can take them through customs. <laughs> so you can actually get very silly with bolt cutters. So those are just a cheap pair. They cost $20 or equivalent, 20 euro equivalent. Um, but one of my colleagues got a pair of four foot ones, so that's I can't remember what that is in centimetres. Somebody will have to convert. Um, 120 centimetres. Um, and we tried those. What can you do on a little, Can you do any further? <laughs> no, now, normally that's not a normal attack thing. But some of these, um, that definitely could go through. Probably this one you could go through. And probably even up to that. So just be careful, you know, things can happen. Obviously, carrying 120 centimeter bolt cutters around is a bit of a giveaway. 
So onto the latch. Now, there's some mechanism. So here's a sort of cut up of one of the latches. I think that's of the Uvatron. There's attack vectors on there. We have magnets. So this bit here is a magnet. You can often just pull the magnet across and drag it across. A lot of the internal gubbins are not magnetic. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Shims again. The hammer. You can often just force them open. Um, often you can just bash against your palm if they're weak enough. Brute force. This one I could probably pull open if I tried. An earlier version of it, my first one I actually killed because I did actually force it open by hand. Um, and one of my colleagues was testing uh, another lock and he put it on his washing machine whilst he was making a coffee. The washing machine went into spin and it popped open. <laughs> so here's another one. This is uh, the micro lock again. This was found by lock picking lawyer again. Um, so there's a rubber bung up at the top, which you can pop out, and you can get a thin shim in that little hole there, which can allow you to pop round and actually disengage the latch. Motor attacks. So this is the internal gubbins. So you can make what's called a spike tool quite easy. This is my spike tool. It's made from those three components, which is a battery, some, some jumpers and some electrical tape. And here's a quick how-to. I'm not giving any secrets here. I won't, you know, hack into the pen Pentagon this way, but you never know. So I'm going to attempt to try and spark a spike this. It may work. Sorry. M one of the worst bits is actually getting the orientation right. So there's a couple of wires here, and in theory... Damn it. This normally works about two times in every three. There we are. Won't lock again, though. <laughs> right, thank you. <clears throat> uh, the charge port. As I said, a lot of modern ones use USB now uh, because it's a simple way of charging the cell. There's enough circuitry out there. It's dirt cheap. Um, I don't actually have... Most of these ones are charged by USB. I've got one lock which doesn't actually have a charge port. If it dies, you're buggered can't open the lock or anything. Um, I have seen them before. This is a dump from one. It enumerated a CD-ROM drive. I'm not certain what that is, and to be honest, I haven't investigated work further. And this is the one which is the majority of the bit, is the Bluetooth sensor. Now, I like hacking Bluetooth. It's just one of the things I do, because <laughs> I quite like Bluetooth. Um, and also, it's easy. Imagine Bluetooth low energy, which is most of the Bluetooth you get. It's like a big spreadsheet. So it's relatively easy to do things like this. Um, so there's attack vectors specifically for Bluetooth. You can sniff them. That's an Uber Tooth LE. You can get it one for about 20 euros. Um, you can get cheaper ones, but the, uh, the Ubertooth works the best. You can do replay attacks. Bluetooth low energy is generally not encrypted. So you can replay stuff, and you can just play stuff. So, um, you can just programmatically mangle stuff with a cheap USB dongle. This cost me about five euros, is the one I use. Um, just to show you some, some ones, this is a tap lock which my colleague Andrew um, managed to crack open. So Bluetooth uses a sort of address. It uses a MAC address. So instead of an IP address, it pretty much looks like a MAC address. Six octets. So the tap lock uses a command byte, and then it uses uh, bits of the MAC address to make an MD5, the MAC address which it broadcasts out. So if you want to unlock it, you just have to listen to the lock, listen out, replay those, ma those, MAC, those bits of the MAC address. The Bozzy's pod padlock, which is a quality name, which is this little thing. Um, I only worked this out last week. It's a bit more complicated. It has a password. Uh, the password is six digits of one to four, which if you work out is 4,096 uh, 4, possible combinations, which means you can brute force this. 
Now, it takes a bit of a while because Bluetooth is not, it's a bit like UDP. If the packet goes out, it may get there, it may not. So I've got a little demo of this. Can you see that? No, you can't. Um, right. <clears throat> I can't actually see the screen, so. Uh, right, here's a padlock. Come on. Sorry, one of the problems is the padlocks go to sl oh, I just found it. One, one of the problems is the padlocks go to sleep because they try and reduce battery usage. So I'm just pressing the button there to start it up. There we are. So it's found the lock. It's trying to guess the password. <laughs> and it's unlocked. Now... <clears throat> Now, I've got to admit, I shortened that deliberately, and now it's locked in a position. That I'm, it's now locked in the wrong position. So I shortened that because I knew what the password was, because otherwise it would take about an hour. Um, oh, wrong screen. OK, I don't know what I've done there. Uh, give me a sec. Right, so that's better. So now I'm going on to the final one uh, for these is the no clock. Not the no key, which is an early one and is done by an American company and actually runs a proper bug bounty and has been tried up by many people and failed. This is a no clock. It's a cheap Chinesium lock. Like this one, which I accidentally unlocked earlier, and the mic lock is a clone of it. The majority of ones you'll see on Amazon are these or clones of them. Now, to, to actually hack this one, I, ha I found the easiest way was to reverse the Android APK. Does anybody here develop an Android? Yeah, or reverse Android. So if you have or you haven't, this is a rough guide to how Android apps gets written. You have a language like Java or Kotlin. It goes into um, Android Studio, may go through ProGuard for obfuscation, then comes out as an APK. The advantage about this is you can reverse it. So when it compiles it, it compiles into a bytecode that can easily be reversed. So the reversing one is you take your Android app, pass it through, in this case, I use JADX as a decompiler. You may occasionally deobfuscate, it turns into Java. So I'm going to cut this bit down. So originally when I did this, there was about 15 slides of me going through the process. And to be honest, I bored myself. Um, so I cut it down to three. So when trying to find something, you write, uh, uh, write into something in Bluetooth is writing to something called a characteristic. So you can search from characteristic and see where that is written to. You can see it up there if you've got really good eyesight. You can see where it says write characteristic. And then searching back, through every single call leads to how the packet's made up, which are these three boxes, boxes here, which is a command, define a load of random data to stop replay, and then something else, which I couldn't work for ages, which resulted, um, the next call that was used in was something that wasn't decompiled. So uh, Android apps are written in a, in a bytecode called Dalvik which I had to then manually reverse on my scribbles, and that's the reverse one, which then goes into yet another set of decompiled stuff, and finally gets to what's called, uh, where we get, some, get a notification request, where it takes something from the device itself. So basically, we can see that it's made of a, com com a command byte, a client token, and some random padding. So the client token comes from the device itself. One of the easiest ways to decode in this on Android is you can do a HCI dump, which will actually tell you everything that's gone through Bluetooth. I can just load that up in Wireshark, and I can see what the content of that dump is. And here it is all decoded. You can see a little pattern here of the token that comes through, and a bit of memory leakage here, because, you know, who wants to sanitize their memory? There's one final bit I haven't mentioned is that all of that gets encrypted through AES. 
quite strong. Um, quite strong AES. It's you know hard to uh, reverse. But there's one little tip. When the whole thing comes, it comes with this little QR code. And you enroll in your app on the QR code, which sends this message to the API, which returns this response with this key. So if you can get hold of the QR code, you can get rid of the key, and you can you know, get it to work. But what happens if we don't have the QR code? Well, we found there's another call. As I said, it sends out a MAC address, and everything on Bluetooth works on a MAC address. There is this call here, where, where you can find the item by, by MAC address, and there's a key. And so I made a flowchart. <laughs> I don't do flowcharts. I'm not a developer, really. So I'm going to do another demo now. And again, I haven't sacrificed the gods today, so this may or may not work. Oh, do you know if I click the right thing, it may work. Right, so here's, I'm just pressing the button on these to reactivate them, but they're, that one's already unlocked. So that gets an API token, which it needs. That's actually just locking itself now. Yeah, yeah that's finally relocked itself. Uh, let me actually unlock that now. There you go. <clears throat> oh, I always do that. Sorry, wrong window. No. So there's one vector left, and this is a bit um, which I haven't actually done before, even in beta test. So uh, hopefully, it's slightly better, and that's the API. Now, one of the reasons why I haven't done it is because there was disclosure on it. Um, and now is past the point where I can actually disclose some stuff in here. So one of the things that we found is, as Dave Lewis at the start mentioned, is, you know, how long has SQL injection been on the OWASP top 10? How long has, has anybody heard of insecure direct object reference? How long has that been around? We thought that died out about five years ago. No. It's coming back. What we find is injection, broken access control. So we did try and disclose this to a number of different vendors. There's different lots in here. And many time ago, we made the bingo, the disclosure bingo card about the sort of responses we get from uh, vendors when we try and disclose stuff. And we, ha we have literally had every single one of those responses. Which one do you think we got? <laughs> Nothing. So no clock. I have tried multiple methods of disclosing since January to them. Um, so oh, I duplicated that slide. I'm sorry about that. So we're going to talk about the cloud. So first off. Obviously, I can't be Irish. I can't have be called Orlodge. Or we get not only a SQL injection string, we get a stack dump. Now, I couldn't go any further because, of course, there are laws against this sort of thing. So I cannot attempt to go any further than this. Uh, but I wouldn't trust that database. Now, here is a sample request. Um, so this is how you log into NoClock. Can anybody see the floor here? a security vulnerability here. Sorry? That's right. So that's a basic one, all communications across HTTP, which is quite frankly ridiculous in these days. Uh, SSL certificates don't even cost money anymore. You know, my personal blog is encrypted and changes with a valid SSL encryption. I don't pay any money for that. 
So once you're logged in, we have this important thing here, a token, which is an authorization token. Now, in theory, all I, need, all I can, should be able to access is my own stuff there. And even So here I am looking at somebody else's one. Actually, it's the same email address. I do apologize, but um, <laughs> that's just what happened to be in my Burt block log at the time. So it's the same address, but look at some of the stuff I get back. I can get back for any user the whole dump, including a password hash, which is, have a guess what, what, what that is, MD5. So these are some of the requests that you can do. In total, this allows me to do a number of things. I can gather your email addresses, PII. I can take your lock. Not only can I, un can I unlock your lock, I can steal your lock. I can take it away from your account, and I can put it on my account, which means I can stop you using your lock, which I think is a lot more tricky than actually just unlocking it. I can steal your passwords, and nobody reuses their password, do they? And finally, when, you unlock, when, when the way the lock works, it stores the GPS coordinates. I can, I can literally sit at my desk and I can look and go through and find people's where physical locks are locked. That doesn't even make sense, that sentence. I can find out where physical locks are and make out, go out of my way to find your locks and unlock them. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Very cool. I'm actually glad you didn't hit anything with a hammer. These <laughs> demos were much more appropriate. Unfortunately, health and safety often gets in the way. Yeah. Well, you're right next to an open window, so a blowtorch would have been fair game. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for Dave about... Yeah. Uh, you worked uh, You worked quite, uh, quite fast through two slides, but um, did you say that when you charged one of the locks, it appeared as a CD ROM drive? Sorry, say that again? Uh, did, uh, yeah, you worked uh, pretty quickly through the, through the USB charging port yeah. slides, but uh, did you say that one of the locks uh, appeared as a CD ROM drive? Yeah, one of them appeared as CD ROM. It's then, this, then, then my follow up here. question is Did you try to eject the CD ROM drive? <laughs> No, I didn't. That is a brilliant question. Um, I, have to, I, I think what that is, is I think that's a dump from the fingerprint sensor. Um, but I, quite frankly, I got bored of doing that lot because it wasn't that exciting. But I will try and eject it next time. Thank you. Uh, just a short question. Yep. Have you found any good smart locks? Some good smart locks, yes, there are. I can't give you names, unfortunately, because they are customers. Coming back. Have you looked into door locks? Um, what, smart door locks? Yeah, smart. smart door locks. Yes, there's a disclosure coming about one of the companies for that. I can't really say anything yet because we're still waiting on that to time out. Anybody else? I'm wondering if you if you think that uh, the benefits of these locks are oh, sorry are worth it in uh, many applications, or are we trading a type of security in the form of mechanical locks that we kind of understand for something that is a mysterious black box? I'm showing a bit of a negative slant on them here. Yeah. There are decent locks out there. Um, it's the same as any teeth in new, new technology. Some of them will work, some of them have flaws. One of the problems here is they're trying to get stuff out quite cheaply and trying to make it and you know, get it into the market as quick as possible. They're not doing the due diligence. They're not getting things tested. Um, as an example, the SLOC, I can't undo the Bluetooth interface for that. Um, that it, cause it comes to a point where you, it, once it gets bound to an, to an account, you cannot unbind it, which is good. That's how it should be. The problem with that one is you can take the back off very easily. <laughs> um, as a point of demo, here's 
uh, one I took apart very quick, very easily. Um, and in fact, you can take the back off that one with a screwdriver that comes in the pack. <laughs> All right, anybody else have questions for Dave before we wrap up here? People are getting ready for dinner and socializing, I guess. Okay, one more, yeah. So I understand you cannot uh, disclose the good ones that you found, but uh, would you say the price is uh, an indicator of how these locks, how good these locks are, or they're not connected? I think that would probably be quite fair. Uh, the, the, the bottom end of the market, the really cheap ones, the ones that are about 20 euros, 30 euros, most of them are rubbish. But did you find expensive ones that are rubbish as well? Um, Actually, no. Um, I tend to go for the. I've. I'll start again. I've tended to 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 sort of attack the cheap one so far. We found there's one of them which I can't really go into, which is an expensive one that was not brilliant. We found a number of bypassing, including a very thin wire, would allow you to bypass the lock. Okay. okay thanks. All right. If uh, if that's it, then I will. Uh, give you a, a token of our appreciation for coming all the way over here to Norway. As soon as I pull it out from under your bolt cutters. Yes, so we started the day with, an, uh, with a foreign Dave and we're ending with another. So here you go, guide to Thank Norway. You. That would be very useful. <laughs> and uh, when you come back, which we hope you will, then uh, you'll, you'll be prepared this time. <laughs> Thanks.